Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about Wonder Woman. <laughs> <laughs> We're actually recording this only a week and a half after it opened, I think. Yeah. But you won't be listening to it until into July because of other commitments we had for the episodes of the podcast. So we're trying to be fashionably late, I suppose, <laughs> with our discussion. But at least no spoilers that way. I, yeah. Assuming you have seen it. And if you haven't, well... We're going to make spoilers, yeah. presumably. So also because we are recording this only a few days after we recorded the previous episode, which has not yet released, we don't have any follow-up. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to get straight into talking about the movie. But first, we're drinking some cocktails. And this time we were able to go very, very topical with our cocktails. We're drinking... Wonder Woman's? <laughs> Wonder Women? Oh, that sounds weird, doesn't it? How do you pluralize... <laughs> We are drinking two Wonder Woman cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> and credit here goes to a Reddit user, and I will link in the description to the recipe. Uh, but there was a user on Reddit in the cocktail sub who came up with a cocktail for the movie specifically. And if you look at the pictures we've put on the website, you will see that it features, among other things, a lemon twist of truth. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is a really awesome bit. Uh, a lemon twist made to look like a lasso tied around the cocktail. And I'm quite proud of myself for actually achieving that on ours. It is a blend of rye, sweet vermouth, benedictine, cherry hearing, absinthe, peychaud's bitters, and cranberry bitters. Except we didn't have cherry hearing, so it was another cherry liqueur that we have. And we didn't have absinthe, so we used Pernod. But it's really closer than we usually get with some of these. <laughs> <laughs> so shall we try them? Sure. It's nice. Strong. The uh, Pernod and the cherry come through strongly. <laughs> mm hmm But so does the rye. Yeah. yeah Definitely taste of rye. I like it. But it's a powerful drink. Yeah. That seems fair. <laughs> I'm going to take my lasso of truth and dump it all into the drink, coiling it from so it's more lemon zesty. All right. Well, without out of the way, shall we get straight into talking about the movie? So what we're going to do is we'll do a quick review and recap of our reactions to the movie itself. And then we're going to talk... Obviously, there's a million podcasts out there that will give you a review and a breakdown of the movie as a movie. So we're going to try to focus on some of the things we find most interesting. We're going to talk about the origins of the Amazons in various different ways. We're going to talk about the history of Wonder Woman herself and some of the use of myth in the movie, things like that. Indeed. So Wonder Woman is directed by Patty Jenkins with a screenplay by Alan Heinberg and a story by Heinberg, Zack Snyder and Jason Fuchs. It stars Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman and Chris Pine, along with Robin Wright, Danny Houston, David Thewlis, Connie Nielsen, Elena Anaya, Ewan Bremner, Saeed Tahmaoui, Eugene Braverock, and Lucy Davis. The story is inspired, of course, by the DC comic Wonder Woman, and we'll be getting into those origin stories and, and the comic background in a moment. So first, how did you like the movie? <laughs> <laughs> I really liked the movie. I thought it was excellent. So did I. <laughs> the end. No. <laughs> yeah, I, I did too. I really enjoyed it. I wanted to like it going in, and I did. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the genre of superhero movies, mm -hmm. I think it's pretty clear it's the strongest offering from the DC universe in universe quite a while. In, yeah. In quite a while, possibly ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you have to go back to some of the early Supermans maybe to, but they're so so far away and so it's such a difference in, in the yeah, genre yeah. so many things have changed in how yeah. superhero movies are done that it's hard to compare those mm -hmm. and it i think ranks up there with the best of the marvel mm -hmm. superhero movies so it's yeah it's a definite cut above anything that dc has done in a while yeah yeah i mean it's not a perfect movie of course mm -hmm. and some of my love for it does come from the fact that it's telling a story from a different point of view than so many movies do. And I was very aware of that, right? It's a movie about a female hero, and that's just not something you see a lot. Yeah. And so I was predisposed to like it for that reason, and I did. <laughs> it didn't disappoint me. Right. 
That said, there were a couple of things. Uh, I would like to acknowledge what a number of people I know online have mentioned, which is that while women of color were represented in the movie, they got almost no lines. Hmm. There was still a distance to go in that mm -hmm. area of representation. I saw somebody talking about it today who said, you can love Wonder Woman, you can love what it does, and you can say that there's more that it could do for women of color and we could do better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. You can do both of those mm -hmm. things. And that's sort of where I feel. I feel like it was wonderful to see this story and to, I, I really enjoyed it. But that doesn't mean that I don't acknowledge that there's distance it could go. There were also some elements of mansplaining in it. Right. <laughs> With Christopher Pine's character, yeah, yeah. you know, explaining some very obvious things. On the other hand, they also played with that. Yeah. They the, had him sort of be awkward or flustered or... Trying to explain things and then her saying, yeah. I know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> what, what is your problem? Like the yeah. all the scenes on the boat were yeah. very nice yeah. that way. So that was, I think it was well handled. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it did what I wanted it to do from this new perspective. And it was fun. Yep. And the action scenes were good. And the core message was good. Some people were, were annoyed about the heterosexual love interest story. Right. And I can't argue with that in the sense that, as I said with the King Arthur movie, I'm always against love interests. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just in general wish they, they probably were... could have just left that out. They could have honest. left that out because she could have been just as upset. Yeah, had they never slept together, mm -hmm. right? They didn't have to have had a sexual mm -hmm. connection in order to for her to care that much about him. Right. And I think that would have been a better story, maybe. What I would have liked about that is it would have given a larger significance to her final statement that it was about love. Right. Because then. It's love in every sense of the mm -hmm. word, rather mm -hmm. than focusing on love as a partnership and sexual thing. Right. But all of those are, to a large extent, nitpicks. Right. I thought the movie as a whole took me on a good journey, had a good arc, uh, developed the characters. If I think about what we were recently talking about, the King Arthur movie, in comparison with that, mm. we got to understand the background and the motivation of our main character. She grew, she changed, mm -hmm. she had a development of character. Our subsidiary characters also developed and yeah. got character arcs. There was motivation even from the villains. Yeah, yeah. Not so much the German villains. We didn't really get a lot of motivation from them. There was a lot hinted, for instance, in Dr. Poison's background right. that was not expressed. I presume some of that stuff is known to comic book aficionados. Yeah, she's yeah. in the comic books. Yeah. yeah. So I can understand why they gave it to her, but didn't necessarily mm -hmm. explore all of it. But Ares yeah. had a fully developed motivation, you know, yeah. and, and a motivation that had changed and grown over the years. Mm -hmm. So he was a villain with a proper motivation. So thinking about the criticisms we had of King Arthur. Right. Uh, I don't think I could make the same criticisms of this. Yeah, I agree. You know, and one of the sort of nitpicking, and it, it may be a conscious choice, and it may have been the right choice. You know, you were talking about lack of representation of women of color. I would say that there's a lack of representation of women generally in some ways in the main part of the film. Once they leave the mascara. Once they leave yeah. the mascara. And that may be a, an intentional kind of trying to draw a sharp contrast mm -hmm. between the mascara and the very patriarchal because they were obviously trying to play that up, you know, the way they had the politicians become completely all unable to cope with the fact that with... there was a woman in the room. Yeah. 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 I think that probably was intentional. Mm -hmm. Even so, I mean, there were a couple of nurses glimpsed, but there could have yeah. been a little bit more of that. There was Etta Candy is the only other sort mm -hmm. of female, major figure, female yeah. character in the, in the real world, the, <laughs> yeah. whatever you call it. <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, Dr. Poison. And Dr. Poison. Yeah, that's true. But yes, I suspect that was intentional. I think that was probably to make her, you know, to point out the way she stood out right. against that very male mm -hmm. background. Mm -hmm. But it meant that she was isolated. But then yeah. if that's plot driven, I don't have so much problems mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. There seem to be a couple of split opinions about the representations of the other diverse characters. Right. I haven't done a lot of reading on it, but what I saw was that in particular, the character of Chief right. was actually from a number of Native American sources, mm -hmm. very welcomed. Okay. The director had asked him, you decide what you're going to wear. You choose what symbols you're going to use. You have some influence on what your discussion 
what mm-hmm. your lines will be. Right. And he felt very empowered by that, the actor did. Right. And that people who saw it, you know, he's, he doesn't just have some sort of token role in the yeah, movie. He no. has, you know, a role equal mm-hmm. to the other subsidiary characters. Yeah. He's not a main character, yeah, but, yeah. you know, there's that sort of band of, of characters. And I did think it was interesting that they gave both of the characters who were people of color a pointed line about that. Yeah. Right? So yeah. Chief says, my land was taken. I have nowhere else to go. Yeah. Who took it? His, his people, people. Yeah. right? That's a really yeah. direct line. And then... Samir says he wanted to be an actor, but he was the I wrong was the color. wrong color. Yeah. yeah. So both of those, I thought that was really mm-hmm. interesting that it was not like just in the background, that there was a really direct line that says, you know, this is a problem in the world. And I think that maybe kind of fits in with your point that there were no women mm-hmm. in the real world. Mm-hmm. That was made less, I mean, more explicit, but also less explicit. The idea that people are suffering Mm -hmm. for reasons they shouldn't suffer Mm -hmm. or are not able to fulfill their potential. Mm -hmm. Everyone has their own battles, as Samir says. Right. I thought that was really interesting. I mean, it wasn't nuanced and a full exploration of these complicated questions in the world of (laughs) post-colonial. You know, it was a superhero movie. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) But for a superhero movie, that's That's pretty pretty nuanced. (laughs) So I thought that was good, too. Mm -hmm. And all of that with, you know, lots of fun, kick-ass scenes. Yeah, I thought the action scenes were really well done. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. Really stylishly done. Yeah, yeah. No, it was visually very nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, so I don't want to do a blow-by-blow of the movie as a movie. Right. I mean, I think we can come back maybe to some of the hero myth aspects of it a little later mm-hmm. if we're ta- when we're talking about myth in general. But the reason why I could decide that we had to see this movie so that we could talk about it in the podcast, <laughs> basically I decided I wanted to see the movie and take the kids in, therefore the podcast would be my excuse. Right. <laughs> but the reason I decided that was okay is because there's obvious connections to things that we've talked about and sure. our interests. So let's start with a little history of Wonder Woman. Yes. Now, you know, this is probably stuff that many people have have kind of encountered uh, because there's been so much press around this about the sort of background of the creation of the character and, and her creator and some of his ideals. But for those of you who haven't, the character was created by William Moulton Marston who went by the pen name Charles Moulton. So he was a psychologist and he, in an interview in the early 1940s, he was asked in an interview what he thought about the role of comic books in society and, you know, are they causing violence in children? And that that sort of issue right. has been around apparently a very long time. And he said, well, maybe uh, to some extent, but not necessarily. And that he thought that comics could play a really positive role and he could envision a really you know good comic book character and from that comment he sort of got around to creating (laughs) exactly what he thought would be an ideal comic book hero and that was wonder woman right and so he specifically said that like later on after he had created the character that she was propaganda for the type of woman who should rule the world (laughs) he was a pretty radical feminist for his day right He had some, I suppose, what we now seem a little odd ideas about gender and sexuality, but they were, you know, as I say, very progressive for his time. Mm -hmm. He had this idea about it. It has to do with his his philosophy surrounding bondage, basically. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm I'm not a a psychologist or a history of uh, psychology so specialist, so I'm I may not. Well, expresses and... exactly right. But his idea was that freedom and empowerment came from willing submission to a benevolent authority is right. the way he put it. And the, you know, he believed this for both men and women. Mm-hmm. Right. So he thought that and, and he kind of portrays this in the in the comic stories that he wrote, this idea that love is is all about submission in a mm-hmm. sense. Mm hmm. And that that thought and various elements of that thought have been explored in a whole bunch of different ways, both to do with sexuality and in other kind of contexts, yes. but especially in sexuality Yes. over the years. And it certainly hasn't gone away. And I think there's lots of uh, ways in which that concept is explored in bondage mm-hmm. and S&M now and in various different kinds of approaches to sex- sexuality. Yeah. yeah, But even leaving aside the, the kind of sexual aspect mm-hmm. of it, he believed that a truly happy person is one who submits to the authority of society 
in some sense. Okay. Some of his critics sort of said this is the path to dictatorship. Right, right. And he thought that was a misunderstanding of his idea. Right. So, as I say, there's there's some nuance and complexity to his theories that, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm That we not, may not be able to express able to in entirely, this podcast. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> But I'm sure we can put a link to more information about him in yes. the show notes. Indeed. And the just to, to sort of put a plug in, I mean, there's a recent book, I think, that I've only had a very quick glance at, but it's called The Secret History of Wonder Woman. And all the articles that you, you may see in the popular press these days probably draw heavily on this. It's by Jill Lepore. Right. We'll put a link we'll to put that. We'll put a link sure. to that. The article that I mainly sort of had a look at for research purposes for this podcast was an article by, by Jeffrey C. Bunn called The Lie Detector, Wonder Woman and Liberty, The Life and Work of William Moulton Marston. So that's uh, that's what I'm mainly kind of drawing from. Drawing from. Because that's the other thing he's known for, right? Is, is the, the lie, lie detector, detector and also a blood pressure test. Yes. Well, the blood pressure test was basically one of the components of, of the, the early lie, de the early lie, lie detector. detector. Yeah. The polygraph graphs several different physical responses, symptoms, physical yeah. symptoms of stress or whatever that uh, are an indication, according to those who believe, those that, who the believe that the lie detector, detector is true. true. Which it's not, for the record, the lie detector is a piece of crap. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that he's no stupid or anything. No. The blood pressure detection... That's a good thing. That's a good thing, yes. <laughs> it's so, just its connection to the idea that yeah. it can tell whether you're telling the truth or yeah. not. He came to that by studying the physical symptoms of deception. So mm -hmm. he was specifically thinking of right. lie detection when he... Hence the lemon peel of truth. The lemon peel of truth. That's right. <laughs> so he, he obviously he write, writes this in in a sort of magical way into mm -hmm. his comic book in the in the lasso of truth or the, the lariat of Hestia, <laughs> if you prefer that term. The other kind of thing that you may hear about Marston in popular press is his own married life. Mm -hmm. Complicated um, relationships. Complicated relationships. He was married, mm -hmm. uh, but he also had a longtime lover who lived with him mm -hmm. and his wife, and it seems to have been an amicable arrangement for, for the... Polyamory, the, basically, polyamory. It, before yeah. the term was used yeah. in that way, yes. And in fact, after he died at quite an early age in his 50s, the, the two women uh, continued to live together. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they had children and they shared the... the they co-parented, uh, Co-parented. Yeah. So clearly they were on good terms. Good terms. Mm -hmm. And both of these women were uh, a major uh, influence on his creation of the Wonder Woman figure. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, his wife, Elizabeth Holloway Marston, apparently was the one who specifically said it should be a woman when he sort of started coming up with the idea of a superhero who wins through love rather than through right. violence and force. She apparently said, good idea, it should be a woman. Right. And he obviously agreed with that, that and suggestion. And came up with a woman who was really violent and good at winning through force. Well, <laughs> except that's not how in her, his early comics, the ones that right. he wrote, right. that's not typically how, how she, she was, wins. how she wins. She wins out. Uh, there's a lot about, instead of re retributive justice, it's all about rehabilitation and regret of the, the villains. So they're sort of rehabilitated right, right. rather than punished. Right. And her main weapon is this lasso of truth, right? Right. Uh, providing insight, I suppose, into the psyche and so forth. Um, so those it's more, would be wrong, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's more psychological victories than, I mean, not to say that she doesn't also use, you know, force to physical ability. Force she, people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, it's a little bit more complex than, you know, the way that you see Superman or Batman, mm -hmm. I suppose, win out in their stories. So to what extent is that carried through in this movie? Well, I think what I one of the, the points that I thought, oh, that's interesting, is when soon after arriving in London, they're kind of cornered by these mm -hmm. uh, German spies. Mm -hmm. And she says, oh, you're under the control of Ares. Ares. I'll free you. Right. 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 So her instinct is not to, you know, just to punish, to punish yeah. but to, to save, to rescue everyone, right. rescue the villains. True. However, her actions that she takes mm -hmm. are violent. Yes. Right? She yeah. attacks. I mean, mm -hmm. she's also very defensive. Mm -hmm. In that scene, she, at least in part, mm -hmm. is just defending herself against bullets and things. Yeah. So that's one thing. But in that scene and later, she also does take violent action against people. She hits and kills yep. And, yep. And, and attacks people. 
so I just wonder how, you know, is that something she was doing in those early comics as well? Or is that something that comes into the later stories of Wonder to Woman? To some extent, I think it it, it is. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I haven't really read the really early comic the really books, early so stuff, I can't yeah. I can't say for sure. But mm -hmm. I, I don't think that, that that the physical force is absent completely. Right. But it's not the main focus. It's I not think. her purpose. It's yeah. not her purpose. Yeah. I mean, this, these, these ideas are directly engaged with, you know, when she's a young girl, her mother says mm -hmm. to her, violence is to be avoided. Yeah. We, yeah. You know, this is only, that's only a last resort. We train just you know, as a as a safety measure, mm -hmm. but it's not something to to want to 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 idealize or right. uh, strive after. Right. And so there is that discussion there. Mm -hmm. And then you know the the real kind of shocking moment when she kills a man that she thinks is Ares at the end, the the German yeah. general. She has this kind of moment of of regret. I've killed someone, and it's not him. I didn't read it necessarily read it as regret. Way? I. She was upset it wasn't Ares she because was she it thought Ares, yeah. it was supposed to have stopped all mm -hmm. war and it mm -hmm. didn't. And that was very upsetting to her. I didn't actually read any particular regret for his death hmm. in that moment. But I wouldn't. There was certainly no glee at his death. No. Yeah. And she was very upset at that moment. Yeah. So, you know, it's hard to read how much of that mm -hmm. was meant to come from what source. Everything that she had hoped and thought she was yeah. going to do fell apart yeah. in that moment. So, yeah. you know, she's, well, and, she's and devastated from a lot of different reasons. So. What she was hoping to achieve is she she wanted to see the soldiers stop fighting, yeah. not just oh, and save, you know, one side, but to see both sides Yeah, and I stop totally fighting. agree with you on that. I mean, mm -hmm. that was very clearly her entire goal mm -hmm. the whole way through. And in that sense, it's absolutely, you mm -hmm. know, her, her goal was pacifist. Yes. Her methods is all I'm asking, you know, all I'm talking about really mm -hmm. here because her goal, there's no question about what she wanted to have happen and she mm -hmm. thought she was able to do. Just from the perspective of, you know, fighting, I mean, Superman, just because you mentioned him, Superman's not exactly all about the violence either. No. At least in the mm -hmm. early, mm -hmm. maybe in the more recent movies, which is one of the reasons people don't like the more recent movies. Yeah. Uh, in the comics and the earlier movies, I mean, while he was able to be violent, yeah. he certainly did not want violence. No. And yeah, yeah. he certainly did not want to punish people. That yeah. was not a, you know, vengeance is not a thing. Batman, Batman on the other is hand. about vengeance. Yes. But Superman is not about vengeance. No. So true. just for the record, it's That's not like true. that there weren't other heroes who yeah. had that yeah. ethos. You know, and that doesn't detract from the mm -hmm. importance of Wonder Woman having that, that vision. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I said to you already that one of my inner conflicts with the movie is I loved it. I enjoyed it. I like superhero movies in general. I loved the sort of female empowerment elements of mm -hmm. it. I loved the early scenes with child Diana practicing her her moves on, you know, while she watched everyone train. I mean, they were adorable and heart-wrenching. At the same time, my inner pacifist is horrified at my thought that female empowerment only comes through being equally violent with the men right. <laughs> and being able to trade blows and being able to fight. And the whole setting of the movie, which is in World War One, mm -hmm. of course, which is such, you know, as they make very clear in the movie, a stupid war for stupid reasons. Yeah. But nonetheless, there's a complication in there in the storyline even mm -hmm. of the idea that they're trying to sign an armistice, but the main male character is trying to prevent them from signing an armistice now for good reason because he thinks it's not really mm -hmm. a real armistice but still an armistice is what we need and mm -hmm. and the triumphant scene of them crossing the no man's land right and yet what the hell is the point of crossing no man's land and right. gaining that 10 feet of ground and yet the movie also kind of addresses that by the way the whole mm -hmm. village is then gassed yeah. and this victory turns to ashes mm -hmm. and has no significance so you know I, I don't think the movie is simplistic in its treatment of this issue mm -hmm. but at the same time i can't quite reconcile my own views on it right like i've I find myself emotionally invested in it and mm -hmm. I love it and I think it's great and yay, kick ass women. And then I think, but I don't want anybody kicking ass. Mm -hmm. Why am I happy mm -hmm. that women are doing it just as well as men? Why does this make me pleased? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's why I ask about, you know, his original intentions and the way he treated her originally. Well, and I think, you know, originally there was this sort of intended 
paradox between a figure who had kind of, you know, these incredible strength, godlike powers and right. everything, who at the same time sought the way of love. And right. it is this kind of nonsensical paradox that, that it kind of resides in where, the, where, where there's this tension that I think was kind of the original intent. idea of it, right. the original intent. I don't have a problem with that being something being explored mm -hmm. because I think that's something we all face. Yeah. You know, every day it's mm -hmm. a real truth of people's lives is how do you reconcile real world needs yeah. and reactions to ethical principles and how does that work? By the way, just getting back to the creator. Yes. His longtime extramarital relationship with the, the woman that, that he was um, involved with, Olive Byrne. Mm-hmm has an interesting set of connections herself. Her mother, Ethel Byrne, and her mother's sister, her aunt, Margaret Sanger, were early birth control advocates. Oh, yes. And opened the first birth control clinic in the United States. Margaret Sanger is a name I know. Yes. She basically founded what became Planned Parenthood. Right, yeah. She is quite famous. Ethel Byrne, is, her name is not quite as well known, but yes. So that's, I just thought that was an interesting little connection. Well, indeed, because <laughs> in the story of female empowerment, birth control is, a... is fairly central. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Be, the ability to control one's fertility yeah. is indeed key. Yes. But of course, although the Wonder Woman character is you know, this icon of, of female empowerment. Mm -hmm. She suffered at the hands of sexism herself in the comic book industry. Right. Unsurprisingly, I suppose, to the point where, you know, when she, there was um, something called the Justice Society of America, which is a kind of precursor to the Justice League. It's right. A, a superhero team, right. basically. And she was, you know, one of the members of that. She was made the secretary, <laughs> even though she was probably the most powerful superhero <laughs> on the team. Uh, she probably got them coffee and took the minutes, yeah, yes. Exactly. But but to my mind, even worse than that is during the 1960s, Wonder Woman was literally depowered. She had to give up her superpowers to stay in the, the human world. And mm -hmm. so she... I mean, <laughs> I'm going to cry. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and she was basically, you know, the, the storylines all revolved around her being sort of lovesick for the, the male interest, the, the, her male love interest. And she fought using, you know, kind of, it's partly influenced by the, the sort of 1960s, you know, Emma Peel sort of characters of, you know. Right, of the Avengers. The and Avengers things. and that yeah. sort of thing. Not the Avengers, the superhero Superheroes. Avengers, the yes. other Avengers. Yes. yes. Um, so they, they turned her into sort of a more of a super spy kind of figure. But I mean, Emma Peel is awesome. Yes, but but depowering Wonder Woman, <laughs> yeah. I did not know that <laughs> oh. until I was you know doing doing some research and reading around it, and um, yeah, that's that's a thing. <laughs> that's a thing. <laughs> Didn't last that long. It lasted a few years, I gather. And you know, with the nineteen seventies TV series, kind of it, it right. revived interest in the character and right. and her original point. Right. <laughs> Yeah, the character has not always been treated well. Oh, and I should say that, of course, there is one particular power that Wonder Woman has, and apparently all the Amazons had, that we should be very connected to, her multiple languages. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I did like that there were several mm -hmm. scenes which hinged you know, on her being able to speak many languages. Many languages, yeah. yeah. That was kind of a neat touch. Yeah. It was great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just for the language geeks among us. <laughs> Okay, so that's Wonder Woman's history. Now, when he created Wonder Woman, obviously, the origin story of Wonder Woman, which is mm -hmm. used in this movie, is that she's an Amazon. Yes. So let's talk Amazons. Okay. Start with their name. So this is a bit of a an unknown, Yeah. but the Greeks had a theory, which is... Okay. First thing is, Amazon is, while not a Greek word in the sense it comes from the Greek language, a Greek word in the sense that the way we know that word yes. is from the Greeks. From the Greeks. Yeah. It is the Greeks who use the word Amazon. Yeah. And nobody else. Yeah. And so they had a theory that is a folk etymology, but they thought it meant without a breast. So it's, it, it would be Greek Amazos with without a breast. They explain this to mean that the archers supposedly removed one breast to allow the drawing of the bow mm -hmm. more easily. Mm -hmm. But that explanation no doubt arises from the etymology, not the other way around. Yeah. For instance, in Greek art, they are not ever portrayed no. with only one breast. No. So 
it seems to be a late rationalization of the name, which the Greeks themselves could not find another meaning for. They didn't know where that name came from. The most favored modern theory about where the name comes from is that it's from an Iranian uh, compound, Hamazan, meaning fighting together. Right. So it's a warrior. It's a warrior. Word. It's a term for warrior. Yeah. So the question of the etymology takes us into the question of who were the Amazons? Did they exist? Why did the Greeks have this word? Mm-hmm. What did they mean by it? So I could spend a long time (laughs) talking about this, but the first thing is the Greeks had a series of myths about a tribe of warrior women who either did not have men in their group at all, or who used men uh, in a subservient role in a gender switch, who treated the men as the Greeks treated their women. Most of the time, the story is that they simply didn't have men. They refused to rear male children and they interacted with males only to procreate. But sometimes some of the stories say that they had men who they treated as as domestics. Which was a, an idea that was kind of nicely reflected in that boat scene in the movie. Yes, yes. When she says male, we they, they came to the determination that males are necessary for procreation, but not, but not for, for pleasure. pleasure. Yes. Mm-hmm. Now, in the myths, there are uh, Amazons reappear frequently. There are a number of named Amazons. There are important figures. Mostly they turn up in connection with Greek heroes. So they are an opponent of Greek heroes. Most importantly, they fight against Heracles and Theseus and Achilles. And that is uh, an element, by the way, that's picked up in the comic books. Mm -hmm. The idea that the Amazons were once enslaved by Hercules. Right. And their bracelets, they all wear those, those magic bracelets. They're called the bracelets of submission as a reminder of how they were subjugated by Hercules. Which is interesting because the main story about Heracles, well, there's a number of complicated stories, but Heracles was sent in one of his labors to get the girdle of Hippolyta. Right. And in that story, he goes and he finds Hippolyta who falls in love with him. And they live for a time in peace and sexual frolicking. Mm -hmm. And then she gives him the girdle. Right. Or in other versions, he steals the girdle and murders her. But there isn't a story in which Mm. the Amazons are subjugated to Heracles. Mm -hmm. That's not a thing. Mm -hmm. However, so he, he does fight against the Amazons. In most of the versions, no matter what his relationship with Hippolyta herself, the other Amazons fight against him. Right. He kills a bunch of them. Right. And he takes her her girdle. The girdles in in Greek myth, the word that we're translating as girdle refers to a belt that women wore. And if you took their girdle, you were taking their sexual chastity as well. I mean, it's it's, it's very straightforward sort of idea. So that seems to have been transferred to the bracelets then, because in the comic books, there's the story that if... A man chained them by their together by their bracelets, they would lose their powers. So right. it's the sort of source of their power in, in a right. sense. Right. Yeah, it's a source of their chastity, the girdle. The girdle. Okay. So I guess the question is whether their chastity is, is their, their power. power. Yeah. And that's not an impossible reading of it <laughs> by any means, but it's also not the entirety of the story necessarily. Mm-hmm. So that's Hippolyta, and of mm-hmm. course we take Hippolyta becomes the queen who is in the story right in in the wonder woman story then we have theseus who in some versions goes along with heracles and kidnaps the sister of hippolyta antiope Mm -hmm. who is the antiope in the story in other versions he takes hippolyta herself on his own trip or he takes antiope herself in the end one way or another he takes one of the amazons home as a wife for a while and she bears him his son Hippolytus, okay. who is his son, who is devoted to the goddess Artemis, like his mother, and uh, rejects sexuality. And then there's a whole bunch of other stories about him, but I won't get into that. So that's Heracles and Theseus. The battle of Theseus against the Amazons. So he takes their queen back with him or some element of the Amazons back with him. And then they come to try to get her back. Hmm. And so there's a great battle between the Athenians and the Amazons, which becomes a really important piece of Am- of Athenian art, hmm. equivalent to the Gigantomachy and the Kentaromachy, the centaur wars, the, mm-hmm. the wars against the giants and the wars against the centaurs. And they all three are depicted in multiple places in Athenian art. And they really focus on being a battle of the Athenian 
civilization against the uncivilized forces. Right. Right. So there's the force of the gods against the giants, mm -hmm. the Athenians against the centaurs, mm -hmm. the Athenians against the Amazons. Right. All of those are a story of civilization versus the barbarian versus lack of civilization versus chaos. Mm -hmm. And so the Amazons in that equation are very clearly equated to the centaurs, to the giants, to these forces of nature that are opposed to the Athenian way of life. When Heracles fights the Amazons, a similar antithesis is being expressed as well because Heracles is everyone else he fights, everything else he fights is a monster that threatens civilization. So if he fights the Amazons, then so facto, they must be a threat to civilization as well. Hmm. So the Amazons stand as this inversion of civilized Greek life because they have, they're ruled by women. Women fight instead of men. They are the opposite of what a civilized male Greek world view is, right? Just like the centaurs who are half human and half animal and who don't live in cities and who get drunk when they drink wine and who rape women are the opposite of civilization. The third most famous Amazon is Penthesilea. And she is the Amazon who is killed by, who comes to fight on the side of the Trojans in the Trojan War. And she is killed by Achilles. And the story, this is not in the Iliad, but the later story goes that as he killed her, he fell in love with her. Hmm. In the moment of like, the right. spear going in. He fell in love with her, but it's too late. So there again, we see an antithesis between Greek heroism and the Amazons. Mm -hmm. And as always, the Amazons end up dead. Mm. <laughs> and this is the other important element is always when they fight, they always lose and they always end up dead. And they are sexually attractive, but they are sexually attractive in a way that leads to their death. So that's then a myth. And I think we can see that in the Wonder Woman movie, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they're all sexy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all the all the Amazons that we see on Themyscira are sexy. Wonder Woman's sexuality is explicitly discussed <laughs> multiple times mm -hmm. that she is sexually attractive. What she doesn't do is die. Right. She is opposed to civilization, but the inversion here in the comics and I guess in the movie is that what is expressly civilized is sort of being shown to be maybe not so civilized yeah. right so I think that's an element more in the film than in the comic books I mean right. the original comic books were were produced during World War II right and set during World War II and I think there was very much the idea of Wonder Woman versus the Nazis yes yes no that's fair um, I'm thinking more of the fact yes yeah, so in the movie the way she comes into the city and she's like, London is horrible. Yeah. And she has to wear all these stupid, stupid clothes. clothes. yeah. And civilized life says that women can't come in and talk to the parliament and yeah. things like that. And there we're shown that her version, her barbaricness yes. is more civilized than yes. these trappings of civilization. Exactly. Yeah. Now that is a quite common modern trope. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yes, you're you're quite right. That's probably more more the more movie, the movie than, than, than the comic the books, I think. Yeah, and she doesn't die. Yeah, <laughs> so that's the big difference from her as an Amazon. Yeah. And I mean, that's I, I laugh, but that's a really important difference. Mm -hmm, when mm -hmm. when he chose to make Wonder Woman his mm -hmm. model, and to say that they were Amazons, I mean, that's a crucial difference mm -hmm. between the Amazons of myth and the Amazons of Wonder Woman. Well, the Amazons in, in Wonder Woman in the comic books were often imperiled. You know, mm -hmm. they were often being attacked and... Um, oh, but imperiled is different get, than I don't think dying. they get die. They yeah. die. They yeah. have to be rescued or whatever, but... Um, well, or not just have to be rescued, but actually die. Yeah. Actually are defeated. Defeated. Yeah. Right? I mean, that is the end of every story in Greek myth, is right. they're defeated. In the comic books, they get sort of enslaved or mm -hmm. captured or, mm -hmm. you know, it's, again, it's this sort of right. extension of this bondage idea. Right. Um, they're, you know, enthralled in some right. way. Right, right. Okay. Now, that's them in myth. And I have to take a moment to talk a little bit about the idea of were there really Amazons? Because this has been a question that has come up quite recently. Well, it's come up before, but there's a book that was published in 2014 by Adrienne Mayer that has been called on quite a lot since then, and especially in the lead up to this movie, 
It's called The Amazons, Lives and Legends of Warrior Women Across the Ancient World. And in it, Adrian Mayer draws attention to archaeological finds and suggests that the Amazons of Greek myth are based on, or are, uh, Scythian women, women from Scythian tribes. The book she has written is a popular history book, and it does not engage in a deep way with the details of the archaeology and the scholarship. What it argues is that essentially there were nomadic tribes, specifically the, what were known to the Greeks as the Scythians, among whom women were also warriors. And there have been burials discovered in which women, uh, female skeletons were buried with weapons and armor and show signs of wounds from warfare, which is pretty good evidence that they probably fought. Now, Adrian Mayer goes on to make a number of arguments about uh, the equality of women and men in these tribes, the level to which the Greeks knew about them, and the, and the influence that these tribes had on the Greek conception of the Amazons. I don't want to get into discussing the details of those <laughs> claims. Uh, they're complicated, and the evidence is sort of very, on a very detailed level. What is definitely true is that there were tribes around the margins of the Greek world that had a very different role of women in their lives than the Greek classical and pre-classical periods. So the Greek archaic and classical periods had women's lives that were very circumscribed. The world of the 6th and 5th century Athens was a world of, of patriarchy. Women were confined to the home. They were not allowed to participate in public life. They certainly were not allowed to participate in military endeavors. They had a very, very, very restricted life. The question really comes down to whether the Amazons are simply a projection of the inversion of that idea or whether they are based on real people who were inversions of that ideal or some combination. And I can't really say what is interesting in Adrian Mayer's book is the evidence for a lot of cultures that had warrior women. And I think that's really interesting and it certainly deserves to be explored and looked at. To call those people Amazons, as a New Yorker article that I will link to does, is problematic. If for no other reason than it's clearly only the Greeks who ever called them Amazons. Right. So to call Scythian warrior women Amazons is essentially cultural imperialism. <laughs> I mean, they never called themselves Amazons. Mm -hmm. That's a whole set of assumptions that the Greek world had about them. Mm -hmm. We don't have historical records from those people because they were not literate. Right. So we only have archaeological sources and the Greek thoughts about them. And many of the Greek sources that are in any way contemporary are, you know, Herodotus, who's <laughs> he's named the father of lies for a reason, whose ethnographic details are always suspect. But, you know, the Greeks could easily have looked to the margins of their world and seen people who had radically different ways of dealing with gender mm -hmm. and been shocked, appalled, and fascinated by them and used them as part of their sort of construction of these mythical inversions. The fact to me, I sort of think, well, if the Amazons are based on tribes of equal women, then are the centaurs based on tribes of actual half men and half horses? And are the giants based on really big guys? I mean, all of them seem to me expressions of anxiety about what it is to be civilized and what the opposite is. Hmm. The Amazons are the opposite because they invert the genders. The centaurs are the opposite because they're bestial. The giants are the opposite because they are violent and unrestrained and hugely powerful. I don't see the need for actual physical people who embody those characteristics in order to pr produce those myths. But that doesn't mean that if there were people who had some of those elements, they couldn't have influenced those myths. And there are some interesting things. Um, Adrian Mayer does point out something that I do think is definitely interesting in light of the Amazons in the Wonder Woman myth, mm -hmm. which is that we have a few dolls from the ancient Greek period who seem to be Amazon dolls. Oh. Maybe. <laughs> uh, she points to two in particular, and I'm going to link to them because they're in the Louvre. And I don't know much more about them than what Adrian Mayer says and what the Louvre says itself. One of them is from Athens in the 5th century, and it is a doll and orthoarticulated joints that has a helmet on it. It's female, hmm. clearly female, and What's has it a helmet. What's it made of? Um, ceramic. Ceramic. Okay, so that's why it survives. Yeah. 
Now, Mayer says it must be an Amazon because it's got a helmet, but it's nude. And then a naked doll of Athena is unlikely because that's the other obvious um, in Athens. Right. Athena wears a helmet. She's a warrior woman. That's not perfect proof because it could have been these dolls seem to have been made to be dressed. And the dress, the clothing wouldn't survive because it would have been cloth. So it's possible this was made to be dressed. But I also can't prove that it wasn't an Amazon. Mm -hmm. You know, that's. That's basically unprovable either way. And either way, it suggests that girls had dolls that were warrior women. Right. And that's pretty cool. Yeah. There's also another doll that's from the Roman period, so quite a lot later, from Asia Minor, not Mm -hmm. Greece, that's clearly an Amazon. It has the sort of uh, one breast covered, one breast uncovered, the helmet, the belt that Amazons wore. Like it's it, this one, I'm not arguing, is an Amazon. It's definitely an Amazon. It has articulated legs, but it's from the Roman period. So it just, mm. it's a little later. It's harder to tie to Greek conception of Amazons. But nonetheless, these both seem to be dolls, probably played with by girls. It's not entirely clear. You can't tell whether they were votive figures, whether they were religious, mm. or whether they were toys. toys. Mm-hmm. The articulation of the joints does suggest they were toys. I mean, if you want a votive statue that you're going to pray to, why does it need to have its legs move? Right. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, that does seem like a toy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we definitely have other dolls from the ancient right. world. So, so early is, Wonder Woman action figures. It, exactly. It is very hard not to make that connection and say, you know, girls were playing. And so whatever the role that Amazons played in Greek myth and thought, one of the great unknowns is what women thought of them. Hmm. Because all the stories we have are male. Right. Right. So there are these male stories of these warrior women. We don't know what women thought of this story of the each of this race of women who lived without men and one could imagine and really when i'm getting into imaginative stuff here but we can imagine athenian women who were very repressed and oppressed by their male folk having a whole set of stories about athenia mm. about amazons uh, and girls being raised with amazon dolls but i can do no more than imagine i don't really have i have no evidence for mm-hmm. it but nonetheless that's a pretty cool little tie mm-hmm. to wonder woman now <laughs> and the role that this movie is probably going to play right for a bunch of little girls so and no doubt there there is lots of merchandise tied to the film mm-hmm. wonder woman action figures no doubt yeah and amazons of all sorts yes yeah exactly so there's your connection <laughs> So as I said, I'm I'm not going to go into like great detail about all of these stories, but there is there is a an ongoing debate essentially about where the template for these Amazons comes from, and to what extent they're based on real life exemplars, and to what extent they are a projection of Greek cultural concerns. And I will link, as I said, to Adrian Mayer because she is certainly the voice for this mm-hmm. idea of historical context. In any case. I think we can definitely see that Wonder Woman is one in a long series of different interpretations of the Amazons as this kind of alternative reality or alternative society in which some of the norms of current contemporary society are overturned or inverted. And therefore, uh, there's space for different kinds of relationships or different kinds of imaginings. And whether that's the kids playing with their toys or a comic book or a piece of feminist propaganda, or now a space for women's voices in the cinema. The Amazons have been this productive, fruitful uh, way of thinking, and also a challenging way of thinking, a way of engaging with problems in society since their first appearance in Greek myth, regardless of who they're actually based on. And that tradition has definitely continued in the various ways that it the stories were changed in the uh, Wonder Woman stories. Indeed. By the way, in case you're wondering, the Amazon River is indeed named after the Amazons of Greek myth, supposedly from a story of warrior women attacking a Spanish expedition, Francisco de Orellana. He had an expedition that sort of traced the course of the Amazon and in one instance was attacked by what appeared to him anyways, a, a tribe of warrior women. And so he named them the Amazons and yes. this the Amazon River, yeah. And Amazon, the book company, is named after the river in particular. Not, not the, the women. Warrior women directly. 
but also I gather mainly because he wanted a name that started with A to be higher in the alphabet. <laughs> Back in the <laughs> so day. So not really well thought out from a mythological perspective. No. Back in the day, young'uns, when the internet was organized it's alphabetically. alphabetically. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Pre-Google. Yes. Trust me, I remember it happened. So this whole question of the Amazons then brings us finally, I think, to the question of myth in the movie. Yes. It bases itself in the beginning on a whole mythological background, right? There's a whole story mm -hmm. about the Greek gods and the creation of the Amazons. And let me just say quickly to get it out of the way, the story about the creation of the Amazons that's given in there is not right. in any Greek myth. Right. There's no Greek myth that even begins to do that. In fact, the only connection of the Amazons with Greek gods specifically says that they are the children of Ares. Ah. And a nymph called Harmonia. Okay. The you know the only place in which they're tied specifically to a Greek mm -hmm. deity is that they are the children of Ares, for obvious reasons. But in the movie, we have them as some sort of bridge between they're they're, they're not human, mm -hmm. and they are created by Zeus. And then there's this battle of the gods, and they're placed on Earth to rescue mankind from the evil influences of Ares. And so. <laughs> I, you know, I just have to point out, you know, time and again, the way that, and, and this is a point that, that you always make, um, <laughs> the way that Greek mythology is sort of mapped onto a kind of Judeo-Christian notion of good versus evil. Yeah, the dualism of Christianity, essentially. Mm -hmm. More Christianity than Judaism, yeah, to be honest. Judaism doesn't, doesn't really, really have a devil, have a devil either, devil. Not, yeah. or, at least in, not, in the, not in some versions of it. Uh, it's really Christian. Yeah. It's basically Christian. Christian, this idea that there is a dualism, that there's a good and there's an evil, and that and it's this idea of, you know, there are equal or at least opposite powers. Right. And yes, you're quite right. It's just foreign to Greco Roman mythology. Yeah. Just does not exist. None of the gods, frankly, are good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and also none of them are particularly evil. Some of them are scarier than others. And it is true that Ares is referred to frequently even by Homer as the most hated of the gods. So I'll give you that. The other gods don't like him because he's a personification of bloodlust, which is kind of crappy. Mm -hmm. And the gods don't like him very much. But he's not evil. He's just part of, you know, the natural world. Humans are full of bloodlust, so there's a personification of bloodlust. Just like mm -hmm. Hades is not evil, although he has turned into evil in most becomes kind of uh, Satan of the movies figure, yeah. yeah most of the movies that, that treat him uh in the in the modern context so yes you're quite right it turns it into this battle of good versus evil in a way that is just completely foreign to the greco-roman mythology but is central to superhero mythology yes. so i'm not really that bothered by it i mean what is a superhero without a supervillain yeah yeah so and you have to have a villain with enough stature for your hero. So what is a superhero without a supervillain? Yeah. yeah, you can't have a superhero who just has a bunch of minor villains. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work that way. So I, I'm I'm not surprised or particularly bothered by it, but it is certainly foreign to the original stories. <laughs> and Ares also way not that powerful. <laughs> I mean, if there were a story of the gods fighting, Ares would have lost early on. Right. He's not that big a deal. It was funny because our son asked on the way home, so our kids came and watched it with us and said, but don't, how did the gods die? Gods don't die. <laughs> and I said, well, no, you're right. The Greco-Roman gods don't die in the stories. It would have made more sense if it were Norse gods. Yeah. Because <laughs> the Norse gods die. <laughs> so they could have battled and killed each other. He could have made Wonder Woman a Valkyrie after all. <laughs> True. Though that would have been harder to swing the whole love thing. Though really, that doesn't make any sense for the Amazons either. Hmm. Right? The mm -hmm. idea that mm -hmm. the Amazons are all about love rather than violence. Because there isn't every single story about the Amazons in the ancient world is that they are warriors who don't... Yeah who are f focused only on fighting. I think the choice of, of the Amazons was this idea of women without the need for men for their mm -hmm. sense of purpose and... Yeah, no, understandable. But the Va the Valkyries don't really fulfill that role. No, they don't. Role. They don't. They are subservient. Yeah. They're, they're just there to mm -hmm. serve a male figure. No, that's true. But the Amazons, they don't really make any sense no. as people who are focused on love rather than violence. Yes. Yeah. From the no. perspective of myth. 
the film doesn't make a specific mention of the importance of the bracelets at all, does it? I didn't miss no. that, did I? No, I didn't see any of that. I mean, they, there was all these gifts that she goes and takes, but they don't yeah. really talk about that. They Even the outfit she ends up in is right. clearly a gift, but... That doesn't it doesn't address it. She no, just sort of yeah. finds it in that tower. Yeah, yeah. Well, the supposedly the bracelets, uh, the bracelets of submission were at least according to some versions of the comic book, fashioned from the aegis of Athena. Right. Which I suppose would explain how they're you know able to deflect bullets and so forth. Yeah, fair enough. The aegis being the breastplate of Athena, which she had put the head of Medusa on. Right. So a very feminine, mm -hmm. in that sense, uh, weapon. And you said the lasso is the lasso of Hestia? Of Hestia. Right. And that doesn't have anything to do... Hestia is the goddess of the hearth and the home. And what that would have to do with truth-telling truth or... The, so it also has the ability in the comic books to basically control the right. the, the one bound in it. No, there's, I can't there's think no, of anything. Yeah. What's interesting to me is that there was no reference to Artemis in yeah, the movie. Yeah. And, of course, her name is Diana. Right. And Diana is Artemis, Artemis right? right? So she's named after the goddess. And in, in Greek myth, Artemis is absolutely associated with the Amazons. Artemis, Diana, in Roman parlance, is the goddess who is associated with the hunt and with archery. So mm -hmm. obviously connected to the Amazons. And she's virgin and rejects men mm -hmm. and association with men. So she is connected to the Amazons, at least notionally, and specifically in the myth of Theseus. His son, Hippolytus, the son of an Amazon, right. is a devotee of Artemis, Artemis, which gets him into trouble because he rejects sexuality and rejects Aphrodite and gets torn to pieces by horses. Anyway, it's a long story. But that's an Athenian 5th century preoccupation. So right. I'm not saying it's in all the stories. But in many, many stories, especially post-Athenian, so in the Roman versions of the Amazons, they're always associated with Artemis. And clearly he named her Diana mm. for that reason. I mean, that's not a coincidence, no. obviously. Yeah. And in the movie, I don't think Artemis was ever mentioned, was she? No, not that I recall. No. no. So I think it's interesting... There's a little bit of what I said about the King Arthur movie, which is that you pull on the trappings of the ancient world and yet only what you want. However, I do think it doesn't do with the Arthur movie, which is that, you know, this could be said in any time or place. The way the Amazons are set up, they do need to be non-modern. Mm -hmm. They have to have come from a different world. They do have to have been set aside. They have to have met, They have to have a belief in the gods in a way that no modern figure could you know there are elements of that story that are absolutely only work plot wise mm -hmm. if you give it that setting to start off with anyway so i don't i think it is not the same as the king arthur where you could have just said it any time and said who cares but at the same time the creator definitely picked and chose the elements of the ancient world he wanted to work with and and same with the director right like didn't necessarily pick on everything yeah that they could have yeah so i know that wasn't a full scene by scene exposition about the movie <laughs> <laughs> and i return to my point which is i really liked it yep and i want to see more of it yep i hope they do another standalone film not just the team yeah you know the justice league film which is coming out though i do want to see that film yep uh more than i would have would have otherwise otherwise yep yeah. no i agree i want to see that i want to see more wonder woman movies i want my kids my sons to see more wonder woman movies I will wrestle with my own pacifist issues. <laughs> but I really do think in a world of superhero movies, yes. it uh, is a good message. Yeah. I, and I, I would see this film again. So yes, you know, absolutely. it has replay value for me. Yeah. In fact, I look forward to seeing it again. Yeah. And seeing the bits that I missed when I had to take the six-year-old <laughs> to the bathroom, exactly. for instance. Yeah. <laughs> so... Please let us know what you thought of the movie and what we missed talking about that was crucial and we obviously should have talked about and <laughs> silly us for skipping it. Any thoughts you had on its connection to ancient myth and the ancient world? Anything you want to tell us about Amazons? Anything, you know, for those of you who are more familiar with the comic book's mm. history than I am, you know, I was a bit of a comic book fan in my youth, but Wonder Woman was not one of my main ones, really, uh, though I did watch 
quite uh, carefully the the TV show. I have to say, when I was a kid, that was a favorite TV show. But yes, if if you've got more uh, details about how the comic books elements were adapted into the film, uh, that would be interesting to hear. Mm -hmm. So let us know, and we'll be back in another couple of weeks with another podcast on a completely different topic <laughs> because I don't think there are any more movies out <laughs> that I can possibly find an excuse to watch for the podcast. Who knows? I'm going to keep trying. <laughs> this whole idea of going out and, and watching movies in a theater with a serious purpose mm -hmm. purpose <laughs> is a great idea, which I wish I'd thought of sooner. But in the meantime... We'll be back soon with more discussion about the world around us. For more information on this podcast, check out the website www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits. We've also got all the ways you can follow us, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, G+, a mailing list, and Instagram. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is on Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at Alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or to the feed on the website. And please review it on iTunes if you can and if you've enjoyed it. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.